Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, discussion about NATO and Russia. Uh, happy to have you here in this session hosted by the uh, Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. For the bulk of the Cold War, NATO had a very clear and defined purpose. It was deterrence and it was defense. It was about protecting the member states against the Soviet military threat. And then the Cold War ended, and in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And then there was this discussion, what does NATO do now? And over the last 30 years, NATO has come up with different answers. In the 1990s, there were two answers. One was enlargement to underpin the democratic transitions of states that had emerged from the wreckage of the Warsaw Pact, and a second uh, task, which was dealing with the violent breakup of Yugoslavia and the Balkans. After 9-11 in 2011, NATO took on a new mission out of area, and you had NATO air operations outside of the North Atlantic region, including in places such as Iraq and Afghanistan, and in Afghanistan today, there still is a NATO uh, coalition force alongside American troops. But in 2013, it seemed that enthusiasm and interest in out of area operations in NATO began to fade. And there was a discussion at that time, looking forward to the Wales Summit in 2014, what does NATO do now? And in 2014, Vladimir Putin provided the answer. You had seen this period of more bellicose Russian rhetoric towards the West. You had seen a Russian military buildup of both conventional forces and nuclear forces. And then in 2014, you saw the Kremlin using Russian military power first to seize Crimea, and then to provoke and sustain a conflict in the Donbas region in Eastern Ukraine, which has now claimed more than 14,000 lives. And that has led NATO basically go back to its original purpose. How do you deal with this Russian security challenge? And I'm absolutely delighted that we have today with us Rose Gottemuller. She is a Payne Distinguished Lecturer at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford and also a research fellow at Hoover. She has a very long and distinguished career both inside and outside of government, including outside at the uh, Institute for International Studies and also as the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center but just some of her jobs inside the US government, uh, a director on the National Security Council during the first Clinton administration. And in the second uh, Clinton term, uh, she was the uh, Deputy Undersecretary of Energy for nuclear nonproliferation. In the Obama administration, she served first as the Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification and Compliance. And in that role, she also had a second hat, which was she was the lead US negotiator for the new Strategic Arms Reductions Treaty that was signed by Presidents Obama and Medvedev 10 years ago last week. Uh, and then she moved up to become Under Secretary of State for International Security and Cooperation. But most relevant for our purpose today is from 2016 to 2019, she was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO and had a front row seat, but also a hand in shaping NATO policy as it reoriented its deal with the Russian challenge. So we're delighted to have Rose Goddard with us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I wanted to start out with my core message this morning, and that is that NATO is a very adaptable organization. Adaptability is, uh, is its watchword, I would say. The response to Crimea that Steve has already talked about and the rise also of Daesh in 2014 was, uh, well, it was a seminal moment for the Alliance, and it led to what is uh, said to be the biggest increase in collective defense since the Cold War undertaken as a 360 degree uh, approach. And I'll talk about what, what that means in a, in a few minutes. But I wanted to say, just again, to back up Steve's opening remarks, that uh, when the Cold War ended, the attention of NATO allies turned out of area to deal with in the wake of 9-11, uh, the fight in Afghanistan. They also turned their attention inward uh, to uh, the issues that had to do with taking a peace dividend and beginning to, uh, to address uh, issues that were in their uh, domestic political arenas. This was exacerbated in 2008, 2009 by the financial crisis. So truly, uh, by the time we arrived at 2014, NATO uh, was uh, doing a bit of navel gazing, I would say. But in the meantime, uh, I always like to say that in 2013, it's a bit ironic, but the last US tank left, uh, left Europe, left NATO Europe in 2013. And it was with some fanfare that this happened because it was seen as a good thing that uh, countries, including the North American allies, US and Canada, were able to repatriate their military capabilities. 
we were no longer in the era of uh, the big exercise such as reforger and uh, everyone is was in some way keen to take a peace dividend but as steve said uh, that all ended with the big wake-up call in 2014 and i want to stress that this was a wake-up call with regard not only to russia but also with regard to Daesh and their seizure of Mosul and their attempt to establish their a caliphate. So um, what did NATO do to respond? First and foremost, the response had to do with a military response. Gathering together at the Wales summit in 2014, they decided that they would put in place quick reinforcement capabilities. This was an emergency response, so to say, and it was the beginning of the so-called Very High Readiness Joint Task Forces, VJTF. These are uh, still in existence today, and they are our kind of first line of reinforcement in the case of a crisis. They are uh, led on a, a revolving basis by different NATO allies. Last year it was Germany, this year it is Poland. And they are part of what is uh, NATO's uh, reinforcement capabilities. It's a 40 thousand strong group. Now the BJTF is much smaller than that, but NATO does have uh, a capability in its uh, 40,000 strong NATO response force uh, to respond uh, rather quickly. So I'm going to come back to talking about that in a, in a moment when we get, because I'm taking you through the, the last couple of summit meetings, but that was the first response at Wales in 2014. And by the way, that was also the year that the famous defense investment pledge was taken. The NATO allies decided that they would spend 2% of their gross domestic product on uh, defense in that year. And of that 2%, 20% would go into modernizing their armed forces. Don't forget that uh, many of the newer allies were former Warsaw Pact members and are still to this day deploying some obsolescent Warsaw Pact era equipment, including MiG-29 fighter planes. So it's some quite considerable uh, capability. So the idea with the Defense Investment Pledge was to get not only uh, the defense expenditure uh, up, but also to ensure that those uh, expenditures were spent on judicious modernization of the armed forces to replace uh, obsolescent equipment. So now let's move on from Warsaw to Warsaw in uh, 2016, from Wales in 2014 to Warsaw in 2016. That is the year that NATO decided on the so-called enhanced forward presence and tailored forward presence. In uh, the north and east of the NATO alliance, this was uh, represented by four battle groups that were formed in each of the three Baltic states and in Poland. These are fairly small forces. They are defensive in nature, clearly defensive in nature. They are uh, small groups, uh, mostly about 2,000 troops per. But the important thing about the battle groups in each of the four countries is that they deploy units from all of the NATO allies, not in every country, but in each country, there are multiple units that come from different NATO uh, allies. I'll just give you an example in Latvia, uh, for example, Canada is there the lead nation, and each of the four battle groups has a lead nation. But in Latvia, Canada is the lead nation. In addition to Canada, there are troops from Albania, the Czech Republic, Italy, Montenegro, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Spain. So it gives you a, a feel for how these battle groups are put together. By the way, the US is the lead nation in Poland the UK and Estonia, and in Lithuania, it is Germany. So these uh, lead nations work together with the host nations to ensure the organization of uh, the battle groups and to lead them. But people ask, you know, well, what good is a, is a small, you know, little troop like that going to do if the Russians decide to go over the border? Of course, they cannot repel a major invading force. But what the battle groups are is a tripwire. They are a deterrence tripwire, and the message is clear and unequivocal to the Russians that if they are attacking uh, that small country on their border, then they are attacking the entire NATO alliance because units from each of the countries are participating and immediately comes into play the famous Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, the famous, as I call it, all for one and one for all part. That is, if there is an attack on one ally, there is an attack on all allies, and the allies come to the defense of the country that is attacked. 
So that was the important decision at the Warsaw Summit to put in place those deterrence tripwires. And I think it was uh, very important indeed. But we went on to the Brussels Summit in 2017, where I was present, understanding that in fact, we needed to have readiness and reinforcement as a, a, a truly inherent part of what we were going to be doing. We needed to build up our capability. We had in place already the, the response force, the VJTF, but we needed to create a culture of reinforcement and readiness in the Alliance. And so that is where the so-called 430s initiative came from. The 430s initiative is uh, 30 battalions and 30 air squadrons, 30 combat ships available within 30 days or less. So that's why it's called the 430s initiative. It um, also uh, really encourages rapid reinforcement, not only from the United States and Canada, but from across the Alliance, from the Southern part of the Alliance to the Northern part of the Alliance. And you might say, well, what, what's the big deal about that? Those distances aren't so great, but you forget that in fact, the infrastructure in Europe is not designed really for military mobility. And, and that problem was exacerbated during the period after the end of the Cold War, because in, uh, in European countries, for example, many railroads uh, were privatized and are in commercial hands. And so they're not really optimized to ship military equipment. Uh, I'll mention here in passing, but it has been a very important part of NATO's work together with the European Union to build up our capability to mobilize forces and to transport them across Europe. And that has not only to do with acquiring uh, you know, the, the train cars to be able to do so, but also road construction, bridge construction, ensuring bridges are strong enough uh, to take the heavy weight of military equipment, et cetera. That's been a very important aspect of NATO EU cooperation, and I would say quite successful up to this point. Now, let me say uh, just one thing uh, about readiness and reinforcement. We have learned some important lessons uh, in recent years, and that is that uh, we need to work harder at it. Uh, I mentioned Reforger. We haven't done a big exercise to bring uh, enormous numbers of troops and equipment from North America, from the US and Canada to Europe since the Reforger series uh, of exercises ended after the Cold War. So in 2018, we took the, uh, took the initiative with a big exercise called Trident Juncture up in Norway of bringing uh, forces and troops and equipment from across the Alliance. And we really learned uh, that we had uh, a lot to learn, that we had to do a lot of work to restore that capability. Frankly, uh, when the Cold War ended, I thought I would never have to think about the so-called GIUK gap again. That's the gap between Greenland, Iceland, and the UK where, of course, transport ships would, uh, would have to go, but uh, never thought we'd have to worry about defending that from, uh, from submarines or from surface ships attacking convoys again. But in fact, that is now a major part of what NATO is, is working on and is working on with countries who are allies such as Iceland. So uh, military mobility and the ability to reinforce uh, on a rapid basis is a very important priority for the Alliance now, and it's a bit of back to the future, to be, to be honest with you. I wanted to talk about uh, this aspect uh, of uh, the 360 degree approach that I mentioned uh, at the outset. There are two ways we think about the 360 degree approach in uh, NATO, and the first uh, is the southeast of Europe. Our allies, uh, Bulgaria and Romania, are uh, really, uh, along with Turkey, literal states of the Black Sea, but very close actually to, uh, to Russia. And Russia is now, as uh, Steve knows, and he uh, remarked very well at the outset, uh, Russia has seized Crimea and unfortunately is turning it into a bit of a, a, as we call it, aircraft carrier in the middle of the Black Sea with a close proximity to our allies, Bulgaria and Romania. So for that reason, it's very important to think also about bringing that kind of alliance solidarity to those countries. And we do so through what is called the tailored forward presence. Same kind of idea allies from, uh, from across NATO are serving in, uh, in tailored forward presence units. Uh, 
uh, in that region. Um, I'll just mention them very quickly, again, not to be written down, but to give you an idea of how many are present there. Bulgaria, of course, Romania, present. Canada, France, Germany, Hungary, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Romania, uh, Romania I mentioned Spain, Turkey, and the UK. They are all present in uh, that area. So I think it is very, very important to note once again this kind of tripwire effect that Russia knows that units from across the alliance are present there, and if they attack in that area, they are attacking the alliance as a whole. But 360 degrees also means the fight against terrorism and violent extremism. The Mediterranean Dialogue and the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative are the ways in which NATO cooperates with countries across North Africa and into the Gulf as well. Mediterranean Dialogue with the countries of North Africa uh, as far as Mauritania and the Istanbul uh, in Initiative with the countries uh, in the Gulf. We have established now, NATO has established a study, study center in Kuwait that has uh, been serving as a training hub over the last couple of years. And we also have a hub for the South in Naples, which is studying the over the horizon threats of those that can come at us on, uh, on the terrorism front. So we are truly looking for ways to, uh, to work uh, expansively in this area. But I do want to remind everybody that in fact, uh, NATO's operations in Afghanistan and now also in Iraq continue. Early after 9-11, NATO came to Afghanistan on a combat mission. Nowadays, NATO is in both Afghanistan and Iraq on a train, advise, and assist mission. So that's very important. It's no longer a combat mission. But nevertheless, the training is focused on helping those countries to fight against violent extremism and against terrorism. So in a very organic way, NATO's counterterrorism uh, principles and, and priorities are in what we are doing, are invested in what we are doing in Afghanistan and Iraq. So those are the ways we think about the 360 degrees. I didn't want to shortchange our counterterrorism fight, even though this session today is about Russia, but uh, I did want to emphasize that we are also concerned with the threats that are facing us uh, from, from that direction. Now let's turn to the dialogue aspect of NATO's mission. Deterrence, defense, and dialogue were part of what was agreed at the Warsaw Summit as our response to Russia and its seizure of Crimea. Dialogue has long been an aspect of NATO's mission, however, and I want to bring you back to the 1967 Hormel report. Harmel, uh, Pierre Harmel was the, uh, the foreign minister of, uh, of, of Belgium. And after the French decided to withdraw from the NATO command structure in 1967 and uh, threw NATO out of Paris, if you can imagine, NATO had a lovely uh, palace on the Champs Elysees for its headquarters. It was uh, thrown out of Paris, but the Belgians opened their arms and welcomed us to a former military hospital on the outskirts of Brussels. At that time, believe me, it was surrounded by cornfields, so it was a bit. Uh, a bit of a come down from the Champs Elysees, but the Alliance was extraordinarily grateful to uh, Belgium for providing that capability. And Harmel provided the intellectual firepower to steady the Alliance during that very difficult period. And he did so with a, a, a short report that really focused in on what NATO needs to do to deal, needed to do to deal with the Soviet Union. And he came up with, again, the same kind of approach, a two-track approach that involved both deterrence and defense, but also detente and dialogue. And that has served NATO very well, now renewed and restored at the Warsaw Summit in the so-called dual track decision, deterrence and defense backed up and joined by dialogue as well. Now the importance of that, NATO is a defensive alliance. The importance of that is that NATO not only is deterring and defending, but also has the potential to change the status quo through dialogue to try uh, if the opportunity presents itself at the negotiating table, joining among all the allies to change the status quo and develop a better way to interact with countries who would pose a threat to NATO. So I think that's an important aspect of it. NATO is a 
an organization that is defensive in nature by its uh, by its very earliest um, uh, charter and also by the way it has been planned and operated from the outset, but it does have the opportunity to peacefully attempt to change the status quo. So that's where the, uh, the dual track uh, decision has its uh, roots. And as I said, it was restored again at the Warsaw summit in 2016. Now, how did that take shape? It's interesting to uh, note that Russia was originally a member of the Partnership for Peace that got established uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union uh, during the Clinton administration. I was actually at NATO the day the Partnership for Peace uh, was launched. It was um, really a way to try to bring in the countries of the former Soviet Union and to make sure that they had an opportunity to cooperate with NATO and whether or not any of them would ever become members of NATO, that was not actively discussed, but it was a notion that we would look for ways to partner with those countries and develop mo modes of cooperation uh, with them. It was interesting that we went on from having Russia as a member of the Partnership for Peace to trying to de uh, develop a deeper relationship with Russia that culminated at the Rome summit in uh, May of uh, 2002 with the establishment of the NATO-Russia Council. Putin was there and it's amazing, you know, to think about that now because it was just uh, a different time is all I'll say, a very, very different time in our uh, relationship. And in fact, there was intense cooperation for a number of years on counterterrorism, crisis management, uh, theater missile defense, logistics, military to military cooperation, Nonproliferation and disarmament, uh, defense reform, and emergency response. I remember very well some groundbreaking exercises that were done with uh, Russian participation to respond to weapons of mass destruction emergencies. For example, if a nuclear object drops by accident off a truck, how do you respond to such a weapons of mass destruction emergency? It's difficult to imagine today doing that kind of cooperative project between NATO and the Russian Federation but it was truly part of those earlier years of the NATO-Russia Council. However, it all ended with Crimea once again, and NATO took the correct decision that such a kind of project work and military to military cooperation was no longer appropriate. And so uh, in that way, the working groups and projects uh, were, uh, were shut down. And uh, from that time forward, meetings have taken place only at the political level, at the level of ambassadors, and we, in the time I was at NATO, had 10 NATO-Russia Council meetings that uh, were held around our NAC table, our North Atlantic Council table, at the level of ambassadors. It's interesting that um, I thought that there was real potential for value in those, uh, in those meetings in terms of confidence building and incident response. And we did have, I think, some value added in the way that we were briefing each other on exercises that were taking place and providing uh, comments and asking questions. And in some cases, it was, a, it was a very good discussion. But in other cases, it was uh, very much an exchange of uh, necessary talking points. I think it was important every time and we felt among the NATO allies and certainly among the NATO leadership that it was vital that we bring up again and again uh, the fact that Russia had seized Ukrainian territory, had taken over the Crimea, and uh, was perpetrating this war in the Donbass. And so every time there were very clear and unequivocal statements of that, as well as efforts by the so-called Minsk Group chairs, UK, I'm sorry, France and Germany, uh, to brief the Allies and to brief our Russian colleagues on how they were hoping to see the conflict in the Donbass resolved through the so-called Minsk process. So. Uh, we did have these uh, 10 meetings in the three years I was at NATO, but uh, it is not the same kind of, um, I would say, cooperative relationship by any means that it was uh, in the earlier per period. Now, let me turn to, uh, before I close off my remarks, turn to NATO nuclear policy, because uh, I know this is an aspect that has long been uh, in play, but uh, you may not know a whole lot about it. The first uh, NATO strategic concept in uh, 
1949 uh, stated in a, a requirement, and I quote here, to ensure the ability to carry out strategic bombing promptly by all means possible with all types of weapons without exception, end quote. I think that's a good statement of where nuclear weapons fit into NATO policy. They are part of a spectrum of deterrence that involves, of course, conventional weapons in the air, at sea, on the ground, and in modern times, we're also concerned about cyber and hybrid response measures. Uh, but nuclear weapons fit in that spectrum of deterrence, and they are never something that would be reached for routinely in a NATO context. NATO allies have been clear and unequivocal that nuclear weapons are unique, and the circumstances in which NATO might contemplate the use of nuclear weapons are extremely remote. NATO maintains full political control over nuclear decision making, and the United States maintains full custody of its nuclear weapons for deployed in Europe. The fundamental purpose, once again, in line with NATO's purpose, is to preserve the peace, prevent coercion, and deter aggression. NATO, again, as a defensive alliance, nuclear weapons fit into that defensive profile. The nuclear mission is based on sharing arrangements for the US weapons stored on the territory of certain of the allies in Europe. I want to stress again that the United States maintains full custody and the arrangements were codified by the US and USSR prior to the signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968. I have to tell you, I'm therefore very impatient with what I frequently hear from Russian diplomats nowadays, that the weapons in Europe are somehow a violation of the NPT. The record is clear, the Soviet government agreed to their presence. Uh, the negotiating record of the NPT is clear and uh, the Soviet government did agree to those arrangements. So I'm rather impatient at those comments nowadays. To support uh, the US nuclear weapons that are forward deployed in Europe, the allies provide capabilities and infrastructure, um, especially primarily dual capable aircraft and basing infrastructure. But I also wanted to let you know that uh, a larger number of allies, not only those countries where the weapons are based, but a larger number of allies are encouraged to participate in nuclear burden sharing arrangements. And there are various ways they can do that. Uh, I think an excellent example of this is the so-called snowcat missions. Snowcat missions are when uh, fighter aircraft, conventional fighter aircraft, would be used in a nuclear operation to escort the nuclear delivery aircraft. So this is uh, what it's called a snowcat mission. NATO is seeking the broadest possible participation uh, of uh, the allies in nuclear burden sharing arrangements. It's important, I think, to ensure that all are invested uh, in, that, in that effort. Now, the number of NATO uh, weapons deployed in Europe, or the US weapons deployed on NATO territory, are small in number. And thus, the strategic forces of the United States also play a role. The strategic nuclear forces of the United States are the supreme guarantee of the security of the allies. In addition, the independent strategic nuclear forces of the United Kingdom and France also have a deterrent role of their own and contribute significantly to the overall security of the alliance. These allies, separate centers of decision-making, contribute to deterrence by complicating the calculations of potential adversaries. Just think about it. Should an adversary decide to attack NATO, they must also contend with NATO's decision-making and make a judgment about independent decision-making from the leaders of the United States, the UK, and France. So last, before I hand the floor back over to Steve, I wanted to say a few words about NATO's most current efforts to adapt. Macron's comments about NATO being brain dead around Christmas time seem like a long time ago, but they certainly created waves at that point. I did not buy all of Macron's critique, uh, but one of its aspects I think is important. He argued that NATO is not doing well enough at horizon scanning, not moving fast enough to adapt to crises. Thus, NATO may lose its adaptive edge and be in danger of irrelevance, even of its own destruction or self-immolation. In December, I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs that NATO really can and should do better to keep a sharp eye on the future. I listed Russia's direction, China's rise, the Afghanistan peace process, and new technology and innovation as arenas that deserve special attention. 
To these, I would now add emergency response. NATO does well in training and exercising allies and partners to respond to natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, and fires. But now, obviously, we also need to be focused on pandemic disease. As NATO defense ministers are going to meet virtually tomorrow on April 15th, that will be one of the top issues that they are discuss discussing. How NATO organize organizes itself for the future in this particular realm will be at the top of their agenda. I would say NATO is already uh, doing something in this space, using its assets in every way it can to deliver emergency medical supplies between and among allied countries. And also they have been uh, using the NATO heavy lift aircraft to, uh, to move emergency patients from country to country for intensive care. So NATO has jumped in and is, uh, is doing something in that regard, but I think it can and should do more in that space. We'll see what the NATO defense ministers decide uh, tomorrow, but I think it will be worth, uh, worth following. I've made reference uh, to um, this effort on the pandemic. If you're interested in, in reading more about it, there's a lot up on the NATO front page, uh, the website, and it's very interesting to, uh, to read about. But if you wanna follow up on any of the issues I've raised today, and I've gone over a lot of issues very, very quickly, I wanna uh, commend to you the Secretary General's annual report, which just came out uh, in March. It uh, will be for the year 2019. It's also on the front page of the NATO website and it has a host of information about what NATO is doing in all of these areas and in more. I didn't have a chance to talk about other important aspects of the defense and deterrence missions, such as Baltic air policing, but look forward to your question and we'll be happy to talk about uh, anything NATO you'd like to talk about. So again, over to you, Steve. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sean. I think you covered a lot of ground and gave us a very clear picture of how NATO is, as you said, going back to the future. Um, let you, you begin to answer this question. That the first question actually is on coronavirus, COVID-19. And you talked about, for example, NATO making available its, um, its uh, logistical capabilities. But a couple other questions. One is you have seen uh, some messaging coming out of China regarding coronavirus. Is, is there a NATO role in countering that message? Or do you think NATO can be or should be more pro uh, proactive in addressing those questions? And uh, you mentioned also uh, steps that NATO is taking, for example, to preserve readiness. But I'm wondering if there's anything else that you might suggest NATO should look at in the readiness area that it can do to maintain those capabilities uh, when also coping with uh, the pandemic. Very good, uh, Steve. Thank you for those questions. Yeah, I have to say both uh, China and Russia uh, were frankly uh, killing NATO in the uh, information space to begin with. They were out quickly. Uh, with very effective and efficient STRATCOM. This, uh, um, many of you would have read the news reports of the, the Russian uh, military medical unit that went down to Italy and lots that was pasted over the Russian media and into the international press about the role they were playing there. China's been doing much the same. But NATO, I think, has uh, gotten its act together and is doing very well to get the word out now about uh, what it is doing. And interestingly, uh, allies from across the alliance, uh, even coming from the United States to Italy, there has been uh, assistance provided. Turkey has been doing a fantastic job on, uh, again, moving equipment, materiel, medical equipment and materiel around the alliance, uh, backing up what um, the capabilities are that NATO owns. Let me just say a word about that because um, it can get confusing sometimes. What is, what is a NATO uh, initiative versus individual countries helping each other out? And clearly, there's been a huge amount of that going on as well. But NATO does own some capabilities, such as the heavy transport aircraft that are based in Hungary. And those have been uh, being used uh, to, to move things around. And, and a word that uh, you may not uh, have heard about is that because they are NATO aircraft, they can take, uh, they can take advantage of a special NATO call sign that means they can cut through uh, the tangle of, uh, of air traffic control in Europe very quickly. And so it has been an advantage for NATO aircraft to be moving military equipment, uh, medical equipment rather, around, uh, around uh, the alliance. That call sign was put in place because of that military mobility problem I was talking about earlier, but it has come into an important use in this pandemic in getting the medical equipment where it needs to go 
uh, more quickly. So as far as what the, uh, what the uh, defense ministers will be discussing, I think they will be considering um, not only these current issues, but what about readiness in the future? How will NATO maintain readiness in the case of uh, future pandemics of this kind? There is uh, some argument out there that in fact, uh, NATO really needs a clear uh, planning process to deal not only with uh, you know, natural disasters in a general way, which it, it does have, but to specify uh, the planning process for uh, a pandemic situation. And I think that will be very much uh, on the minds of all the, the, uh, the ministers as, as they discuss this tomorrow. It, it may sound a little, a, a little dull and boring, what's, what's that mean? What it means is that NATO then uh, does the work to get a plan on the shelf. And so when a crisis erupts of any kind, it can pull the plan off the shelf and quickly move into implementation rather than uh, they've done a good job, but it's been uh, more or less in a quick response mode with a task force forming uh, at Mons under the command of the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. And so, you know, they've, they've been able to respond quickly, but it's better if you can do that planning in advance and pull the, pull the plan off the shelf. Okay, the next question is, um, you know, we've seen the Russians make use of uh, ethnic Russians in the near abroad. So, for example, in Crimea, in Transnistria, you know, as a basis for, in the case of Crimea, they, you know, they claimed in 2014 that that population was at risk. And that was the justification or part of the justification that they offered for uh, seizing Crimea. Uh, if you look at though some NATO members in the Baltic states, particularly Latvia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, each of those countries, or at least Estonia and Latvia, have a fairly significant ethnic Russian population. Uh, does NATO think about that population and how and what that means potentially in security terms for those two countries? Yes, indeed we do, and we think about it in several ways. There's the STRATCOM challenge, once again, because uh, Russia does a lot of, uh, of work to beam television broadcasts and other kinds of media into those states. Uh, many of those populations have a lot of older citizens who, uh, who speak Russian as a, as a first and in some cases only language, despite the fact they've been strongly encouraged to learn Estonian or Latvian or Lithuanian, but they may not have done so. So Russia has a huge uh, opportunity to influence just in that way. So NATO has uh, tried to do a lot uh, to think about ways uh, to, um, to influence hearts and minds as well. I want to tag the uh, Stratcom Center in Riga, Latvia, which has been doing an excellent job in trying to th think through ways to reach out to these populations and also more actively to deal with Russian disinformation campaigns. So if you're interested in this issue and how NATO is handling it, it's no coincidence that that STRATCOM center was put in place in Latvia because of the particular challenges in that region. So it's well worth checking, checking out their website. But I also wanted to flag that there are some very um, interesting ways that the battle groups have contributed to uh, really reaching out to those populations. And they've been very smart about it. Uh, I'll talk about, again, the Canadians in, in Latvia have uh, gotten out every weekend to shopping centers, well, before the pandemic set in and everybody's on lockdown across Europe. But before the pandemic set in, uh, the battle groups would go out every weekend to shopping centers or to high school uh, auditoriums or uh, you know public uh, festivals. And they'd just, you know, bring a couple pieces of equipment and they'd have the soldiers there to talk and they'd let the kids climb over the equipment. And it really created a very, very good, I would say, uh, esprit de corps with the local populations, including the Russian speaking populations. And it's made a big difference. You may see some Russian propaganda about how the locals are upset that uh, Russia's, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, the battle groups are, are there and, uh, you know, blocking the roads with exercises and that type of thing. But in actual fact, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the survey numbers uh, of uh, what the populations actually think, I think those battle groups have done a good job reaching out and, uh, and making friends with the local population. Great. Okay, the next question is, if you look back over the last 30 years, you, obviously today there's a very difficult relationship between NATO and Russia. But are there things that you think NATO might have done differently, uh, even perhaps in the 90s before Putin came to the presidency, uh, 
that might have increased the chances of a better relationship between uh, the alliance and Russia than we have today? It's interesting. This question is one that uh, is debated uh, quite frequently in Europe, not, not just in NATO circles, but quite frequently in Europe. I frankly think uh, we did uh, do a lot uh, to reach, uh, reach NATO hands out uh, to the Kremlin and to, and to Russia. And that uh, the period I referenced uh, of the early years, the NATO-Russia Council, um, were very active in terms of looking for areas of, of shared interest. There was a common airspace initiative, for example, looking at ways to ensure that air traffic control and uh, therefore uh, security of aviation was, uh, and safety of aviation was well established and well well articulated between uh, Russia and the NATO allies. Unfortunately, that airspace initiative has now been put on hold. There are other ways that uh, some of those issues are worked through the ICAO, the international, uh, um, I forget what it's called, the civil aviation organization. So uh, there are different ways that those issues continue to be worked, but I think there were some very pragmatic ways that NATO and Russia were developing common cause on, on certain issues. But uh, there were uh, no doubt also stresses and strains. Frankly, uh, a lot of people uh, point to the Bucharest summit in 2008 as the year in which Putin decided that uh, NATO was uh, not good for Russia because those were the, that was the summit meeting at which uh, the uh, aspirations of Ukraine and Georgia to become members of NATO uh, were, were laid out and agreed by the NATO allies that U uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia would become members of NATO when the time was right. So uh, apparently that uh, did some, you know, um, something to uh, concern uh, the Russian leadership, but at the same time, I think it's unequivocal that NATO was entirely and always transparent with a handout to Russia reaching uh, for ways to make uh, Russia into a true partner of NATO, rather than in any way uh, uh, causing security problems for the Russian Federation. So it is uh, a very, uh, I would say, strongly debated question. I will say one thing before I, I turn back to Steve, and that is people who say that, uh, well, the damage was done earlier when, in fact, NATO decided to take in former Warsaw Pact countries across Eastern and Central Europe. I don't agree with that at all, having been in government during that period and remembering Putin was president at that time. And to begin with, uh, he was uh, not objecting to the way NATO was enlarging uh, in that period. And so for those who say, you know, well, and plus particular uh, particular guarantees were put in place, the so, uh, famous three, three no's, which have to do with not uh, deploying nuclear weapons forward, not uh, uh, bringing uh, militarily significant numbers of troops forward, et cetera, et cetera. These are issues that uh, were agreed in advance with Russia to try to reassure that NATO was not uh, trying uh, to in any way be anything but a partner to Russia. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, if you could make some comment on NATO's perspective on cyber attacks. Of course, a NATO member, Estonia, was uh, you know, a very prominent example of Russian uh, cyber operations a number of years ago. But, but how does NATO think in terms both of the response, but also in the question of deterring uh, those kinds of attacks? Yes, NATO has uh, this challenge before it every day, like uh, all military organizations around the world. It takes uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of cyber attacks every day at NATO headquarters and uh, other NATO operations in our military headquarters as well. So our first issue, of course, is the constant security of our active networks. And that's the first way that NATO thinks about, uh, about cybersecurity. But in addition to that, uh, that has to do not only with keeping the headquarters up and running and keeping our operations up and running, but of course has to do with uh, preparing reliable and resilient command and control in the event of crisis or conflict. So it's, it's very important that that kind of day in, day out cybersecurity. But in addition to which, NATO is actively concerned about uh, cyber attacks in uh, potential crisis or wartime. We have exercised uh, repeatedly in recent years in a way that uh, brings uh, cyber attacks into the scenarios. Uh, 
and so have been thinking about it uh, quite a lot. In the way we respond, um, we have uh, woven it now into the way NATO thinks about uh, domains of operations. Uh, a couple of years ago, the cyber realm was named a domain of operation in the same way that air, sea, land, and now space in addition to cyber, but uh, cyber was declared a domain of operation uh, not very long ago. And uh, that means that uh, NATO works together with the allies, with individual allied countries, so that if the necessity of uh, defending against a cyber attack is out there, that, uh, that individual allies offer up their cyber capabilities to, uh, to NATO in order to help to, de to defend the alliance. In addition, a uh, new uh, cyber uh, center has been established at Mons to provide for more military capability uh, in this realm, and that will uh, continue to, to take shape and develop. But NATO's been doing everything it can in recent years to, uh, to look to this problem and to respond to it. By the way, once again, mention of Estonia, but a very good center of excellence on cyber issues is established at Tallinn in Estonia. Again, if you're interested in, uh, in uh, this from a policy perspective, I think it's a very good place to look. Uh, their website is, is very good on, on, uh, on uh, cyber issues. Great. Okay, the next question is, could you talk for a moment about the relationship that NATO has with Serbia? Obviously, uh, Serbia is a central focus of Russian attention in the Balkans, but what does the NATO-Serbian relationship look like? Serbia is a partner of NATO, little known fact. And in fact, I think uh, the Vucic regime has done uh, a lot to try to balance between uh, Moscow and NATO. And we have been able to work very well uh, with Serbia. I myself traveled twice uh, to Belgrade in my time as NATO Deputy Secretary General wants to attend the inauguration of Vucic as the Serbian president. So we do have uh, a partnership with them and look for ways, again, to uh, seek mutual benefit. We say to our partners, we don't want to just be the ones telling you what, what to do. We also want to hear uh, what lessons you have learned and what you, know, you can help uh, what ways you can help us uh, to do better. In that regard, Serbia uh, in 2018 agreed to uh, host the uh, emergency response exercise, big um, emergency response exercise that we held that year, involving again, not only allied uh, members, but also a large array of partners uh, from across the alliance, all were in Serbia. And so that, that was a great example of how Serbia worked to uh, help provide uh, some cooperation to NATO that was of great benefit uh, to all of us. It was mutual benefit. So we have um, a balance, uh, a balancing act going on, no question about it. The relationship between Belgrade and Moscow is clearly quite, also quite uh, firm with, with long historical roots. But uh, from a NATO perspective, uh, Serbia is a valued partner. Okay. <clears throat> we now have a couple of questions on the Open Skies Treaty. Of course, the backdrop here is uh, these reports that go back uh, six to eight months that there is interest in the U.S. government in withdrawing from the treaty. So the, que the first question would be is, one, do you have a sense for what kind of consultations are taking place within NATO on the Open Skies Treaty? And the second question would be uh, what kind of impact it might have uh, on NATO if the U.S. government were, in fact, to go ahead and formally withdraw from the treaty? Yes, for those uh, listening who are not up on the Open Skies Treaty, this is a, uh, a treaty that has roots in President Eisenhower's proposal, by the way, to uh, open up the skies of uh, not only uh, Europe, but also at that time the USSR and the United States to flights uh, from, uh, from other, uh, the other power. So nowadays, Russia does fly over the continental United States, over CONUS, and also over European countries, NATO allies, uh, and also other uh, states' parties uh, to the Open Skies Treaty. And the United States and NATO allies uh, fly, and others, uh, Sweden's a very active member of the Open Skies Treaty, not a member of NATO, to fly over, uh, over Russian territory. So it's... Um, frankly, uh, a valuable treaty in that the photographs that come out uh, of these overflights are completely unclassified. They can be used by uh, anyone uh, to make uh, 
to make uh, analysis, but also to make points clear at the negotiating table and build mutual confidence and predictability. So for the NATO allies, the treaty uh, is very important because it gives them tools that they otherwise may not have. Many of them do not have the same kind of overhead satellites, for example, that the United States is able to deploy. So it has a great value from the NATO perspective in uh, confidence building and uh, mutual predictability. It also has been an important tool during this crisis uh, over, uh, over Crimea with the Russian Federation. You, the example I like to cite is that when the Russians seized the Ukrainian sailors in the Sea of Azov incident in November of, uh, of uh, 2018, the um, open skies flights over Ukraine uh, early on in the crisis were used to signal in a positive way, but to signal clearly to Moscow that the Alliance and uh, the OSCE, which is the parent body, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, were watching and they wanted to see some resolution of this uh, crisis in the Sea of Azov. So it's a diplomatic tool, it's a confidence building tool, it's important. And uh, the uh, allies have been consulted, this process was beginning. There is a certain skepticism about the treaty uh, in the United States, uh, it's longstanding. It was, uh, there were certain voices being raised in skepticism when I was the undersecretary for arms control during our Obama administration. So this is not a new issue but there are clearly uh, some who are uh, not uh, enthusiasts with regard to this treaty. They have been consulting, however, with the NATO allies, and my understanding is that the NATO allies have very clearly articulated their views of the utility of, uh, of, the, of the treaty. So I, for one, hope that, uh, that this uh, decision that has been advertised in the press is, is not final and that, uh, that in fact there will be opportunities to continue because it is an important, in my view, tool. It's not a perfect tool, no treaty is a perfect tool, but it is an important tool uh, in uh, addressing issues that arise in, in Europe. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, <clears throat> NATO uh, did its last strategic concept exercise a number of years ago. I think it was launched in 2010, and then the strategic concept was uh, blessed at the NATO summit in Chicago in 2012. Uh, of course, Quite a few things have changed since 2012. Uh, is it time for NATO to conduct a new strategic concept exercise? And if so, is there any reason not to go forward with that exercise? Well, I will give you my personal opinion. Again, after three years of, as DSG, I understand uh, that the focus, you know, the, it's, not, it's not an official tagline by any means or talking point, uh, but it is how I viewed the issue. People uh, said, we have got urgent problems going on now. We've got urgent issues uh, in dealing with the seizure of Crimea and dealing with ISIS. Uh, we've just got to get on with it. We've got to get on with the planning. We've got to get on with enhancing and improving our command and control. Again, beginning to exercise reinforcement of Europe. We've just got to get on to it. This is not the time to hit the pause button and go into some big you know, strategic concept exercise. I get that and I got it when I was DSG. However, my own view is, and particularly with this exercise that is going on now, uh, I didn't really speak about it, but, uh, but President Macron's famous uh, brain dead comment launched uh, an effort to put together a, uh, a group to study, in fact, uh, the big issues for NATO, big issues of strategy, objectives, et cetera, et cetera, out of the foreign ministerial meeting that took place two weeks ago uh, Secjan Stoltenberg uh, announced the formation of a group uh, head up, headed up by Wes Mitchell and a French counterpart as well to, again, to, to study these big issues. Is NATO looking over the horizon adequately? Is it ready for big new surprises? Do we have the strategy? I shouldn't say we, I'm no longer DSG, but I, I've got a bad habit. Does NATO have the strategy? Does it have its objectives laid out clearly, et cetera? So that group is now embarked on that. And in that context, I believe that NATO should be looking seriously at a new at a new strategic concept. Again, I stress this is my personal view, but I think it's a long time since 2010. And uh, the fact that we have so much pragmatic uh, work in train now, we're on the right trajectory in these areas uh, like reinforcement, like man and control redundancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that it is time, I think, to think about a new strategic concept. Okay. Um... Could you talk a little bit about 
NATO's military relations with countries in the post-Soviet space, say other than Ukraine and Georgia? You know, how much is going on? Uh, and is there things that can be done to sort of intensify that cooperation? Or is that cooperation uh, in trouble just because of the deterioration of relations between NATO and Moscow? Oh, by no means. It's not that issue at all. Um, I think uh, actually, first point is that the Partnership for Peace still exists. And there are a number of partners from across uh, the former Soviet space, uh, partners as diverse as uh, Kazakhstan uh, and Armenia. Uh, surprise, surprise, Armenia is an excellent partner of NATO's and we work very closely with them uh, on military to military matters. Uh, in addition, uh, countries, uh, well, in, in the South Caucasus, NATO plays a role in uh, trying to facilitate smoother relations, for example, between uh, Baku and, uh, and Armenia, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So there is, uh, I think, there are a number of ways that NATO continues to work with the partners in the Partnership for Peace and, uh, and to really try to de develop uh, good military cooperation with them, again, for very pragmatic reasons to ensure that, uh, for example, if they are participating in peacekeeping operations around the world, that they have uh, the tools to be, to be good peacekeepers. Uh, so there's a lot of pragmatic ways that, that NATO is working with these, these countries. Uh, so I don't in any way uh, say that there's a problem uh, with, um, you know, somehow a, a dampening effect because of the bad relationship between uh, Moscow and uh, NATO. It has to do with resources, to be very honest with you. Uh, right when I, before I arrived as DSG, NATO shut down their office in Central Asia and Uzbekistan. And I was very concerned about that when I arrived. But, you know, the answer to my many questions about it was, look, we just don't have the money. We are stretched incredibly thin. And uh, the work that we do for defense capacity building goes to partners really across the world from as far away as Mongolia, believe it or not, is, uh, is a partner of NATO and we do defense capacity building with them. So how are we gonna set our priorities? And so that is, uh, to my mind, it remains an issue. I was actually very glad last year to see the EU launch uh, a new initiative to reach out to Central Asia because, of course, now with, with China's rise and uh, the development of the Belt and Road Initiative, the Central Asian countries playing more and more of a role as, uh, as that bridge between Asia and, and Europe. And I think it's important uh, that the EU is doing a lot to reach out to them and, and including with uh, financial assistance and aid and so forth. But I do think that, uh, that NATO should continue to be working in any way it can in those areas, in those countries, uh, at the same time recognizing that there are resource issues to be addressed. Okay, <clears throat> let me tie together a couple of questions regarding the Baltic states is, two of the three Baltic states have reintroduced conscription uh, and I think you also have a discussion going on in several in the, in the Baltic states about resistance. The idea that, you know, if NATO cannot stop a Russian attack immediately, you know, what kind of resistance that you might have in those countries, uh, in areas that might be occupied by the Russian military. Uh, how do you see those discussions about both conscription and resistance affecting calculations in Moscow? I think the Russians have a long memory and one of their longest memories is about the so-called winter war with Finland. And so that, to my mind, is really uh, an important factor in the decision making uh, in the Baltic states and also in Finland and Sweden. Sweden too just reintroduced conscription very recently. And, uh, and they're also working to improve the ability of their populations uh, to be prepared in case of a military crisis or even an invasion and to be uh, able to continue uh, to, to, uh, to operate in that context and uh, training, including in training of military units to be able to continue to operate uh, in that kind of uh, environment. So it's across uh, the region and I do believe that, that Russia has taken notice if only in the level of a kind of hysterical disinformation that we see uh, on this matter from, from the Russians. But, Therefore, I believe that what the Baltic states have been doing, not only uh, in reinstating conscription, but in also preparing their populations to operate in the case of, of crisis or conflict, and in Sweden and Finland, that all has to do with a deterrent effect uh, 
that is uh, well uh, ingrained in uh, the, the Russian uh, DNA, and it goes back, as I said, to the, their defeat at the hands of the Finns during the, the Winter War uh, on the, on the, um, at the advent of, of World War II. Okay. Uh, next question uh, gets uh, to the American president. Uh, president Trump over the last several years has said uh, a number of questions that, or made a number of comments that suggest he has a certain skepticism about the value of the alliance. C could you talk about first how that has impacted what you saw when you were at NATO when these uh, comments came out of Washington? And then second, um, what might be useful or necessary uh, after, when there's a new American president in the White House, what sort of things might be necessary to sort of restore the level of confidence that you would like to see between uh, Washington and NATO? Well, there's no uh, question that uh, Trump's uh, remarks beginning during his campaign when he was uh, talking about NATO being obsolete, uh, these remarks had an electrifying effect on the alliance. They were very concerned and I was uh, there when he first came uh, to uh, our new NATO headquarters in May of 2017 and saw you know, his very tough remarks about, uh, about burden sharing, that the allies were not living up to their defense investment pledge uh, from the Wales summit. I like to stress that that investment pledge was made in 2014. It did not really come from, from Trump and, and his, uh, his efforts to, to light a fire under, under the allies on this matter. But uh, nevertheless, the allies were very, very concerned uh, and have been concerned about it. Uh, it has had a beneficial effect. Um, again, after the Defense Investment Pledge in Wales, the cuts to defense budgets stopped. So by 2015, we were no longer seeing the defense budgets in NATO European countries and Canada going down. The cuts had stopped, but they hadn't started to rise yet. And I think that when Trump came to office, it did light a fire under the allies, and many of them began taking the Defense Investment Pledge more seriously and putting more money into defense expenditures and putting more money into modernization, getting rid of obsolete uh, equipment and weapon systems. So it has had a beneficial effect. I know Jens Stoltenberg feels the same way. Uh, in his uh, annual report this year, he said that by 2024, when the Defense Investment Pledge is supposed to come to, true it, to fruition, everybody's supposed to achieve 2% of GDP by that time, uh, the added amount uh, of funding will be uh, $400 billion uh, since, uh, since Trump took office. So that's significant. Nowadays, I think the Alliance needs to be concerned about what the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic are. What are going to be the implications for defense spending all over the Alliance? And uh, I think this is a question I, you know, I don't know what the impacts are going to be, but I dare say there will be some, and we will have to watch this very, very carefully. The other thing I like to say about this question is uh, watch what the U, and I said it repeatedly to the allies and to allied media when I was still at NATO headquarters, watch what the United States does, not what it says. And in fact, the United States investment in NATO continu has continued steadily to go up uh, including major investments in infrastructure in, in Poland, for example, but also elsewhere in the alliance, and a major investment in reinforcement capability, bringing equipment back to Europe uh, to be uh, stationed there as, uh, and in case of the necessity of reinforcement, there will always already be some forward deployed uh, weapons and equipment in Europe. And the US has made a major, major investment in, in that. So um, I do think that it, uh, the U.S. has put its money where its mouth uh, is not in this case. It has put its money into uh, the investments that it had long promised, and it has made those investments, despite the fact that the president has articulated this very, very skeptical view. The last thing I'll say on this, though, is that it has had an impact uh, around the NATO decision-making table with a number of allies. This is where President Macron's remarks partially came from, the brain dead remarks. We've had obsolete NATO, we've had brain dead NATO, uh, but Macron's remarks partially came out of concern that uh, NATO could no longer look to the United States to always be there in a leadership role and that NATO countries, uh, including France, but other NATO countries needed to take more of a role in uh, leadership decision-making for the Alliance. So I think that that uh, is an important point. 
it is one that concerns me. And for a future president, uh, I hope it will be an area where, uh, where that president pays immediate attention. Okay. A uh, couple of more questions back on COVID-19 and, and the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, do you think that there are lessons that NATO can take from how it's had to deal with uh, COVID-19 over the past several months? And would that be then reflected in a new strategic concept if that's done? And then second, uh, do you see a role for NATO in helping countries out of area, outside of Europe, for mm -hmm. example, in helping uh, the countries in Africa, which are now just coming to terms with uh, the pandemic? Thank you. Those are very good questions. Um, on lessons learned, I think that there will be a lot of lessons uh, to be learned about how NATO has handled uh, the, the threat to readiness from this pandemic. And as I said at the outset, I think the decision, the wise decision was made early on uh, to halt things like exercises that were planned, major exercises that had been planned for some time because uh, as uh, it was said to me by a NATO, former NATO colleague, uh, if a force is sick, it's not ready. So NATO made the decision early on to do everything possible to ensure that, uh, that the pandemic did not take hold among NATO troops, whether in the battle groups uh, in uh, Northern Europe or whether in Afghanistan or Iraq. So uh, a lot has been done to, uh, to try to ensure uh, that all important readiness and so for that reason, I think when NATO uh, looks at this, they will be thinking about ways to do even better in future because uh, Steve Pfeiffer and I were just on a call earlier where uh, many uh, were reminding us that this is one wave of this pandemic and we very might well have, in fact, we probably will have in another six, eight, 10 months, a second wave of the pandemic. And so it will be important to think about lessons learned very quickly and how to do better in this near term frame, but also then to do um, some longer term thinking. Does NATO need, as I said, a kind of standing uh, action plan to deal with, with pandemics? I think, again, it's a good idea because then you think through all the issues uh, and you make sure you've got it all planned out so it's on the shelf, you can immediately get moving. But I also want to say that it would fit into how NATO is thinking nowadays about having to develop uh, better resiliency and redundancy to address uh, also military threats. Uh, if you are very, you know, developing more capable command and control, as I mentioned a moment ago, if you have more ability to reinforce, if you have more ability to move uh, troops and equipment around, then you're better able to deal with, uh, with military threats as well. So some of the lessons learned, I think, in the way NATO is um, uh, moving medical equipment around Europe very quickly will serve, I think, to provide some insights and lessons learned for those, also those military operational problems. Okay. Uh, let me ask or put forward a couple of questions on uh, NATO-Russia military context. So you had uh, meetings between the American and Russian chiefs of staff in Baku. There have been other meetings of uh, NATO military leaders with their Russian counterparts. Uh, how does that feed into NATO? I mean, are, are NATO briefed on those kinds of contacts? And then how does NATO see those contacts? Or is it useful? Uh, and then a, a, another question would be is, do you foresee a time when uh, Russia and NATO might resume some of their partnership for peace activities, including military to military meetings? Uh, and I guess the question would be, would be, what sorts of things would have to happen that would open up the door to those kinds of contacts? Okay. We, uh... At NATO, um, the view was taken very, uh, I would say early on, that we needed to continue to have a, a very open dialogue at the political level. And uh, it's interesting that in recent times, uh, there is a, the highest level of military leadership in the Alliance, SACUR, uh, SACT, the, the commanders, for example, they also are um, an inherent uh, part in a way of the civil military leadership structure at, uh, at NATO. So I think in some ways it was natural enough that they were included very early on in, uh, in they always come to NATO Russia Council meetings if, or they send their representative if they're not available. So they uh, are, are present at the table and, and uh, participate in the, in the discussions. And so I think that that uh, is an important point. That's the kind of baseline. Now, the NATO-Russian um, 
contacts that began to take place between Chief of the General Staff Garasimov and uh, the, the, um, the head uh, of the IMS, the International Military Staff, that was General uh, Pavel from the Czech Republic until uh, not, not so very long ago. We now have a German chief for the International Military Staff, but also with SACUR have been very important in this near-term period because of concerns about incident response. Um, you uh, know, you've seen in the press that there's a lot of aircraft flying around the Baltic Sea at the moment, uh, the Baltic air policing uh, activities of NATO I mentioned, but uh, the Russians do a lot to probe that, uh, that policing of the, of the Baltic airspace. In fact, I was asking a NATO colleague, did they see a kind of uh, upping in that tempo? And they said, to begin with, yes, before NATO itself, I'm sorry, before Russia itself became gripped by the COVID uh, pandemic, they were sending out probes, bombers and uh, fighter jets uh, to probe what was going on. Was there any diminution of Baltic air policing efforts by the Russian Federation, by the NATO allies? So it's been, uh, I think, very interesting now, of course, since the pandemic uh, has gripped uh, Moscow and in Russia as well, that that, that has dropped off, but, but they were probing, they, they were attempting. So it's that kind of activity that uh, makes it very important, I think, that we have an open line of communication between our top military leaders, an open line of communication where they can pick up the phone and call each other if there's a, an, a serious incident in the air or at sea. And so that to me has been a very uh, pragmatic and important way uh, that the two have cooperated. There is an open line of communication available at all times, but also they've begun to get together and discuss some of the tough issues that are related to avoiding further accidents and incidents uh, in, in future. So I think it's a, good, uh, it's a good way to go about it. We've been very clear that we don't wanna go back to business as usual. NATO doesn't wanna go back to business as usual. Because we say, or NATO says that uh, for that to happen, it's important to see some results, some results in the Minsk process, some solution to the conflict in the Donbass. Steve mentioned at the outset, 14,000 people killed in that conflict. We, you know, NATO wants to see some action in terms of resolution uh, of that situation before we would consider any steps in, uh, in the direction of uh, of opening up routine contacts on a military to military basis. So that's where things stand. Um, we will see where it goes. Okay, um, a couple of questions about uh, some internal dynamics. Um, you've seen, unfortunately, in Hungary, uh, uh, a pattern of democratic uh, backsliding under Mr. Orban. Uh, how does that affect NATO? How should NATO respond? And then how should NATO deal more broadly with rising populism that we've seen among NATO member states uh, on both sides of the Atlantic? Yeah, these are tough questions and uh, NATO does, uh, does uh, wrestle with them every day. Uh, let me make a few points about this. First, NATO does not have the same kind of tools uh, that the European Union, for example, has. Uh, early on when, uh, when Orban put in place this, this new law uh, during the crisis where he took over um, as well as the executive powers, legislative powers as well. He's basically, you know, ruling by decree at this, at this moment and with no time uh, limit in sight. Uh, so that has been a great concern. The European Union very early opened up an investigation of this and we'll see what, what comes out of that. But they have tools of that kind. NATO does not possess those same tools, but um, Nevertheless, I like to say that what NATO has available is the principles that are uh, laid out very clearly in the Washington Treaty, uh, the founding document from 1949 of the Alliance. And those principles are laid out in the preamble. They are related to democratic values and the rule of law. So every country that signs up to be a NATO member knows that that is the basic expectation uh, laid on their shoulders, that they must live up to those democratic values and, and the rule of law. So uh, we do, the leadership of NATO does everything it can to remind um, NATO members of that. Uh, uh, I know Sec Jen Stoltenberg is very uh, out there in, in talking to NATO members uh, about this. Uh, Turkey's another example that's constantly raised, but uh, 
every time uh, he went uh, to Ankara, he was raising it, talking to Erdogan, same with, with Orban. So they can be in no doubt that that, uh, that is uh, the level, uh, that is the behavior that they are supposed to, to carry out. Certainly, again, when I was DSG, that was always a clear part of my message as well. So that's one thing that NATO can do, and it will continue to do it. I want to talk, though, uh, on a broader historical front about how NATO has confronted these issues over time. You know, um, NATO has had uh, a lot of difficulties with this issue historically. The Salazar regime in Portugal, for example, was a longstanding autocratic uh, regime and uh, only uh, ended with the so-called uh, Carnation Revolution in 1973. And the important thing to note about, uh, about that is the fact that uh, those who uh, brought forward the revolution in Lisbon, it was a peaceful resolution, revolution and led to democratic elections before too long. I'm sorry, it was 1974. That um, group were officers who were trained uh, at NATO, and I want to stress they're not trained in revolution at NATO. That's not what NATO trains in. NATO stands for, you know, a peaceful transfer of power anywhere at any time. But uh, they, are, they were trained with those very principles of democratic values and the rule of law in mind. And so that's what we model at NATO on a day in, day out basis for all those who participate uh, as uh, military men at NATO headquarters or in NATO operations, they are trained to uh, bear these, uh, these uh, principles in mind. Uh, an example, I think is a very good example, is, is targeting. Targeting to bear in mind the necessity of avoiding civilians. Very basic and simple, we can all agree with that, but you know, it doesn't always play out that way when you look at situations like Yemen, for example. So, uh, but, but that kind of training is what NATO concentrates on constantly. And I think it plays an important role in ensuring that uh, those kinds of values develop from the inside out among those who are participating in NATO. Okay. We talked a little bit about NATO's relationship with uh, Serbia, but you, know, you saw both before they joined, but then afterwards you saw Russia conducting various influence operations to try to discourage uh, the trend towards NATO in both Macedonia, North Macedonia, and Montenegro. Um, how can NATO, because I think these operations continue, uh, how does NATO work with those governments to, uh, to counter those sorts of influence operations? Uh, NATO actually has uh, teams, STRATCOM teams, that can be made available uh, to work with countries who are suffering from these kinds of, uh, of disinformation campaigns and has made them available to our allies uh, in the Balkans. And by the way, uh, for those who are watching who don't know, we now have a new 30th member of NATO, the Republic of North Macedonia. Their, their flag was raised over NATO headquarters in Brussels just two weeks ago, and I'm extremely proud of that accomplishment. They did an enormous amount of work to, uh, to deal with um, with long-standing historical disputes around their borders specifically, and not only with Greece, but also with Albania and Bulgaria. So they have done a lot uh, to get where they are today, and I'm really proud of that accomplishment on their behalf. But NATO has uh, been willing to uh, help out in any way it can. It has uh, offered up these kinds of capabilities, and, uh, and certainly in some cases, uh, these countries have taken advantage of it. The Russians are good at this stuff. Uh, there's no question about it. And they put enormous resources into it. It's not, uh, you know, the kind of expenditure we want to make day in, day out, but we have to be as good as we can possibly be to counter these kinds of, of disinformation attacks. So, and by the way, I mentioned that uh, space and cyber are domains of operations now for uh, NATO, but NATO has also established hybrid, the hybrid arena, as another area where we have to put a special attention on uh, being able to deter and defend. And so um, disinformation and these kinds of STRATCOM operations are, are part of those hybrid techniques. So it's no question in my mind it's going to be a major area of uh, priority for NATO going forward and on behalf of all the allies. Uh, you, noted in your, you, you noted in your opening comments uh, the rise of China. And of course, we've seen 
uh, you know, some significant evolution in the relationship between Moscow and Beijing over the last 20 years. I think it's now described as a comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination for a new era. How does NATO look upon that developing relationship between Russia and China? And, and, and what impact does it have on the uh, sorts of thinking that goes on in Brussels? It's very interesting uh, that um, for NATO, for a long, long time, China was very far away. Uh, and interestingly, what woke NATO up uh, to the strong linkage actually between Asia and Europe nowadays uh, were the DPRK long range missile strikes, uh, tests rather, uh, of uh, a couple of years ago, 2016, 17. In those missile tests, suddenly the NATO uh, allies woke up to the fact that Pyongyang could target Brussels as well as they could target Los Angeles. And so interestingly, I think that was, that was a kind of uh, key uh, factor uh, that woke, uh, woke NATO up to the importance of China. But in the ensuing period, it has also woken up to the uh, implications of the rise of China and in a couple of very important ways. Uh, first of all, there are the investments that China is making in uh, NATO uh, countries, in their companies and in infrastructure. And this has been a wake up call for NATO allies because uh, for example, when port infrastructure is purchased by China, when shares in ports are purchased by China, NATO has to begin to ask questions. Is this going to have an implication for military mobility? Will we somehow be denied port access if we need to bring military equipment into a port that is controlled or has a controlling interest in the hands of the Chinese? So these were important wake-up calls uh, for um, the Allies. The other issue is related, uh, but it has to do with technology, and the Americans have been especially uh, articulate in raising the implications of Huawei developing the 5G networks in NATO Europe and concerns that this may pose for communications inside the alliance, the security of communications inside the alliance, and uh, possible implications for command and control in future. So these uh, issues have been hotly discussed and debated in recent years uh, with, within the alliance and will continue to be discussed, I'm quite sure. But if you noticed the London meeting uh, this uh, last December in 2019 came out with a statement about uh, a number of issues, but it did have a statement uh, also about China looking at the challenges that China may pose, but also the opportunities that China poses uh, for the alliance, may bring for the alliance. And I think that's really important uh, to consider. We have to look at both sides of the ledger here. I like to remind people that um, that China, uh, when we had the, the piracy off of the coast of Somalia, Somalia, that crisis in 2014 and 15, it was China who came to participate in the EU-led task force, of which NATO was also a member, to deal with that piracy problem. And they played a positive role in addressing that threat to international shipping. Uh, so China can play a responsible role. We should also look for opportunities to cooperate with them. And as to the link with Moscow, I like to say the two can play with at that game. It wasn't noticed very much, but I love the fact uh, that when um, China went to join uh, Russia in the Baltic Sea for some exercises uh, in, I believe it was 2017, the summer of 2017, that exercise season, they've gone a couple of years now in a row. But uh, we, you know, sent a message to China and said, uh, would you like to do a passing exercise with, uh, with NATO uh, maritime units while you're on your way, you know, up to the Baltic Sea? And they agreed to do it. So we had passing exercises are no big deal. They're not huge training activities, but, you know, you pass, you signal, you wave, you take pictures, everybody smiles. And uh, I thought that this was a great kind of stratcom moment that we should have taken more advantage of, to be honest, because all the attention went to the fact that they then went up to the Baltic Sea for some uh, you know, training exercises, yes, with the Russian Federation. But I would joke and say, well, well, but we got to them first. And, and it's true, we did get to them first. But we should be looking for more opportunities, I think, to uh, interact with, uh, with China 
in a positive way if we, uh, if we possibly can. NATO, by the way, has uh, some military to military staff talks that have gone on with China for some years. And we do talk to them about important areas of mutual interest, such as uh, how to be a good peacekeeper. China is more and more present in peacekeeping operations around the world. And again, we want them to be paying attention to uh, the important humanitarian issues, protection of civilians, protection of the rights of women and children. These are the kinds of things that are very much part of NATO peacekeeping training. And we want to make sure that, that China has those, uh, those same issues in mind. So I think that we do have mutual interests in some areas and we need to look, look to those as well as importantly to the challenges and the surprises, the unpleasant surprises that China may bring. Okay, um, we're in a period where the nuclear arms control regime is under stress as is the non-proliferation regime. So are the things that NATO can do to support the new START treaty uh, and also to support the, uh, the uh, non-proliferation treaty and that entire non-proliferation regime? NATO has uh, a very important role in this regard, and it's, it's little remembered, but during the period when the INF Treaty was being negotiated first uh, in the 1980s, uh, NATO was very involved in working out uh, some of the details of the negotiating position that the US then took to the negotiating table with the Soviet Union. So NATO has a long history of working actively in the arms control realm, and not only in the nuclear arena, but also in the conventional arena as well. So uh, I think today that NATO can and should continue to play a role in this regard. NATO was very important in the decision to withdraw from the INF Treaty. All NATO allies agreed with the US assessment that the Russians were and are violating the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, with the deployment of a new Intermediate Range uh, missile that uh, NATO calls the SSC-8 and the Russians called the 9M729. Uh, so all of the allies uh, were able to assess and agree that this missile uh, is uh, in violation of the treaty and agreed with the US decision that uh, Russia essentially was hollowing out the treaty from the inside. And so it was time uh, to withdraw and to look for ways to respond to a new threat in, in Europe. So NATO had an important role in that. I think it was, uh, it was frankly a wake up call for some NATO capitals who hadn't paid much attention to these issues for a number of years. But it is a wake up call that paid dividends and that now NATO is fully focused on these issues in a very strong and, uh, and concerted way. And uh, all NATO allies have been very much in support of the extension of the new START treaty. So I think that's a, that's a welcome, welcome message uh, to, uh, to Washington who is considering that matter at the present time. But, uh, it's a very important sign of, of NATO's current interest in these matters. I was also really pleased that the NATO allies, this happened just as I was leaving NATO, but the NATO allies agreed that uh, there would be a coherent, a concerted NATO statement in support of the Nonproliferation Treaty at the time of the review conference, which uh, was supposed to take place right now or in the coming month, uh, but uh, because of the pandemic has been postponed uh, into next year. So well, I'm not sure it's been postponed. I, I know they're discussing when exactly they will, they will schedule it. But uh, I do think it's very uh, good that NATO was also able to support in a clear and coherent way the Nonproliferation Treaty as well. Okay, well with apologies to those, we, we still have a few questions in the queue that I don't think we're going to be able to get to because I'm going to take the moderator's privilege to pose the last question, keen up, you know, the point that you just made in your mention of the INF Treaty is um, the US military is now developing a number of missiles that would have been banned by the INF Treaty. It includes a ground launched cruise missile of a thousand kilometers range. And the uh, precision strike missile that the army was developing was going to have a range just below 500 kilometers so it would not be covered by the INF Treaty. But you now see with the treaty gone, they're talking about giving a range of 700 kilometers. Those ranges seem to me to be way too short to make much sense in a Asian Pacific contingency vis-a-vis -vis China. And so I think those missiles are being developed with Europe very much in mind. Uh, I remember um, going through it when I was on the NATO desk back in the 1980s, it was not easy getting Pershing twos and ground launch cruise missiles with nuclear weapons into Europe. Uh, but what kind of a reception do you think that there might be at NATO uh, 
if there is a proposal at some point in the future to deploy conventionally armed American missiles with ranges, say, of about 700 or 1,000 kilometers? Well, when uh, the um, decision was made to withdraw from the INF Treaty, this uh, was done in the context of a very wide-ranging and careful examination by NATO of what response measures NATO should look at. And those response measures included uh, further attention to, uh, to resiliency, to redundancy, to developing the capability if, if such attacks came to, to survive and continue to fight. Also, integ integrated air and missile defense to be able to defend against such missiles, uh, developing conventional forces further in order to deter. Uh, and then uh, the US was clear with the allies and the allies uh, have agreed that as one of the possible response measures, uh, deployment of uh, conventionally armed missiles in Europe uh, should be studied. But it is an option that is under study uh, as uh, the Allies have stressed again and again, and Secretary General Stoltenberg stresses there are no decisions that have been made, and indeed the Americans stress this point as well. There are no decisions made about, uh, about deploying such missiles. And I stress, as, as you have, Steve, that it would be uh, a decision around conventional missiles only, not to bring new nuclear uh, armed missiles into Europe. So that issue uh, is, uh, has been broached at the, uh, at the Alliance, the Alliance has agreed it can be a list of, of these four option areas. Again, I wanna stress building up further resiliency and redundancy, integrated air and missile defense. That's where I think the money should be put. We should be really looking hard at integrated air and missile defense, building up further conventional capabilities. And then finally and fourth, looking at uh, possibility of, of uh, deploying in future some conventionally armed missiles. Um, in Europe. So it's, it's out there. The uh, Allies have agreed to look at it, but uh, no decision has been made. Great. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, first, uh, let me apologize again to those whose questions we could not get to. We're out of time. But Rose, thank you very much for joining us. You've covered a lot of ground, uh, both in your opening comments and also in, a, I think uh, you answered 27 questions, which is a tribute to your efficiency in answering questions. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, please everyone stay healthy and socially distant.